I'm really excited to uh, be able to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Doug Peterson ranches in north central Missouri. He practices holistic management. And I had the opportunity to spend three days with him this past week in Missouri. And I tell you what, the man commands respect. It absolutely amazed me the respect he has from the ranchers and farmers in the state of Missouri. He not only practices the zip, but he shares his experiences with producers all over the United States. And no matter where you go, people speak highly of this individual. In his spare time, he is also the state grassland specialist for NRCS for the state of Missouri. So please join me in welcoming Doug Peterson. Thanks. I think um, it was a it was a great time spending some time with uh, Gabe last week. Um, you know, we've been up here before. We brought a couple of groups. Am I not working? Didn't sound like I was. Now. I was going to have to talk loud. Even if you're from Missouri. As I said, I am a, a, a producer as well. You have to talk quieter now. I'm used to. I'm used to yelling. Um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna. They asked me if I want to stand behind the podium or, or have a have a lapel mic. I said I don't do the podiums very well. It's a good thing that I went to school a long time ago because they'd, they'd have probably had some initials behind my name right now, ADD or ADHD or something, because I do not stand still very well. So the camera guy's going to have to be good. I'll try not to move too much. Um, I, I do, I do uh, run cows with my dad. Um, we run a couple hundred of our own and then a couple hundred contract cows as well. And it's been an interesting road the last few years. Some of the things that we've that we've done, um, and, and I'll and, and I'll go through that, I guess. Um, you know, I've worked for NRCS for about 24 years and, and done a done some good things, done some things that's probably not as good. Um, Jay and I have talked about that a little bit. So. Uh, <clears throat> That's the question. You know, what, what's the land like? And I guess the, the, hard, the hard thing about going close to last here is everybody this morning and, and the previous speakers have, have stole all the good points. So, so, so some of it's going to be a repeat. But, you know, my question is, you know, do we need to heal the land? Um, you guys have all heard. You know, most of us are producers, I'm guessing, in here. You've all heard that. You know, people in the city, they're, they're so far removed from the farm, they don't know where the milk comes from, right? You guys have heard that? This is yes, this is no. Okay. <laughs> my, kids, my kids, they go, Dad, when you do that. Um, you guys have heard that, you know, the, the, the people in the city are, are so far removed, they're three or four generations removed from the farm, they don't know where the milk comes from. The kids think the milk comes from a, cow, from a store, not a cow. I think that all of us are so far removed, we're three or four generations removed from good, healthy soil. We have, and Jay said it, you know, we have accepted that soil is just what it is. It's a degraded resource. We don't know any better. We just think that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, it wasn't until, you know, we tried, tried some different things and, and worked with some folks that we saw we could improve that soil much faster than we ever thought. So, what is the canary in the mine of the soil? And, and this is, and I guess I should, I should clarify too, you know, most of the things that I'm gonna talk about obviously are from a little different environment than you guys. You know, we're in a, in a mid 30 inch rainfall area, a lot farther south from here. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any range land, it's all, it's all introduced grasses. So, Josh said this morning that the, that the soil health principles are the same anywhere. And I believe that. The principles are the same. My, my talk is probably gonna be a little different, uh, have a little different angle than what 
than what it's going to be for you and your ranch land or even your tame pastures up here. So don't, don't take anything I say as a, as a specific recommendation of what you have to do up here, okay? Because it's not. It's, it's my story. It's how, we, it's how we deal with our environment and our soils. But I do think the principles are the same. So what's the canary in the mine of the soil? This is, and I usually tell everybody <clears throat> that, that this is an interactive talk, okay? So I realize it's going to be hard for this big group, so I'm going to designate, say, these two tables right here <laughs> for all y'all, okay? And they have to answer. Is everybody going to agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so you guys right here, you got to answer. This is an interactive talk. We're not going on. <laughs> Organic matter. Okay? Very good answer. Bear spots? Bear spots. I was kind of thinking organic matter. I'll go with that. <laughs> so so what do your soil tests show? Very little. One, two, is that what they're at are in this area? Four up all. Four? Ooh. Very good. Okay? So so what really what really, Josh, turn that thing a little bit. What really, what really determines the potential uh, organic matter in a given area of, of, of the United States, not just right here? The potential, the potential, not, not your management and what you have now, but the potential. Come on. There, there's a lot more of them than there is you guys. I'm thinking, how much mass can you grow? Very good. Okay. What determines that? Well, I was thinking something that you couldn't control. Moisture. Okay. We'll get into infiltration and stuff in a minute. But basically moisture. Okay. How much rainfall an area gets determines how much plants. Uh, granted, management's going to be different. But how much plant can you grow? So what's the other thing that determines the potential? <clears throat> Growing degree days. A little more. Keep going. Soil health. Okay. What, what, what remineralizes that plant material or breaks it down? The biology, right? And that's what this whole, that's what this whole meeting is about. So <clears throat> the, the potential for a given area, for example, got a friend, well, Ray Archuleta that, that was mentioned there. Um, he lives in North Carolina, and I was down there last winter. You know, their soils are half a percent. So, but they get 60 inches of rain. So, so they can grow a ton of stuff, but what happens to it? The, the, the life is, the, the season of activity for the organisms is so long that they remineralize it. They break it down very, very quickly, okay? For example, Neil Dennis, that was also mentioned in Canada, um, he, he doesn't get near as much moisture, but his season of activity for the, for the organisms to remineralize and break it down is much shorter, isn't it? So his potential is a lot higher. I came across, I came across this in a study from Burke and others uh, out of Colorado. And this is, you'll notice, and which button is mine? You'll notice this is carbon. This is not organic matter, okay? Here's a, here's a test question for, for somebody other than Dr. Rakowski. Um, how, much organic, how much carbon is in organic matter? 57, 58%, right? Depends on what study you look at. So this is you guys pretty close right here, right? So you're pretty close to 7% according to this study. This, and, they, and they did what they did here was they looked, at, they looked at soil type. They looked at climate. They looked at temperature. They looked at season of length. They looked at a lot of things. And this is just the potential, okay? <clears throat> soil organic matter is 58% carbon. So if we're going to change this chart to the potential for soil organic matter, we're going to divide that out. And we come up with, according to here, 12%. Now how many of you have got 12%? Does that 12 make your four look a little? Yeah, I feel pretty small. Okay. 
So, you know, is our soil, is, is it that degraded? Even, even, in our, even in our rangeland, even in, your, even in your land that hadn't been farmed. You know, I think a lot of us in Missouri anyway, a lot of us in Missouri, we thought, well, you know, we've got pasture, uh, we're rotating a little bit. That's so much better than our cropland, our crop, cropland cousins. That's as good as it gets, right? <clears throat> and that's just not so. And I think these guys here, um, as well as grazers, are proving that. So, how do we heal the land? You know, purchase soil amendments, um, using the annuals, those are good, um, but they should be a capital investment, not an annual expense. That should be something you do one time, not year after year. So how can we improve soil without purchasing additional inputs, without doing something to the land year after year after year? And I'm not trying to pick, up, pick on you guys for your cover crops. Well, maybe I am. Can I pick on you a little? Just a little? That's, that's a pretty red, those are some big guys right there. <laughs> I bet I can outrun them though. <laughs> the only known tool to heal the land um, is animal impact. Alan Savory said that. And, you know, whether you believe that or not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know that I believe it after seeing some of the things they're doing. But I do know that, that the tool of, of animal impact, the tool of using livestock to heal the land is probably one of the most economical tools you can use to heal that land. Okay? So how did nature build all that soil in the first place? You know, the Midwest is known as the, as the, as the breadbasket to the world, isn't it? We have some incredible soils. We've, we've, we've produced billions of dollars of food out of the, out of the Midwest. How, how did those soils get built to begin with? With grazing, with herbivores, okay? Doesn't work, there it is. So, was it all just bison? No, there was all kinds of herbivores. And, and, and there's all kinds of accounts on how they did it. You know, there are accounts of, of, of vast herds of, of bison and even vast herds of, of antelope and elk, you know, moving through an area, grazing and trampling everything until there was nothing left. Um, there are also accounts of, of smaller family units, you know, 50, 60, maybe even down as small as 10 or 12 family units of bison, you know, camping out on a burned area, uh, grazing all, all season long, and then moving on and probably not coming back the next year. Um, there are also, we, we also know that the that, that all of those herbivores were also influenced a great deal by predators. You know, the wolves, um, that's a, I was in Montana yesterday and that's a, that's a different, the wolves over there is, doesn't evoke a, a very popular uh, thing, but, but the predators made, a, made, a, made an impact on those grazing animals and influenced what they did and how they moved. You know, animals that were being harassed or pressured by predators would move in a very different manner and would have a much different impact on the land than animals that were just moving along slowly and grazing. And it's that, it's that impact, that, that impact of those animals that we are trying to, to simulate a little bit um, with our high density grazing. So what is stock density? That's the term that I'm going to use, and I want to make sure everybody understands that um, really, really clearly. And i got to start talking faster. And you guys can, I could probably talk at three or 400 words a minute. You guys can, can, can listen and comprehend it about 1,200 words a minute. So if I talk faster, you're going to be all right. Let's say we got, let's say we got 160 head of 1,250-pound cows. You know, that's 200,000 pounds. Of, of beef on the hoof. Realistically, that can be, you know, it could be, it could be stalkers, it could be cows, it could be, it could be goats or sheep. It, it'd be a lot of goats and sheep, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> so we put those, we put those 160 cows on 100 acres. Now we're, they're not going to be spread perfectly uniform, but if they were, okay, if if that 200,000 pounds was spread out over 100 acres, how many pounds is going to be on each acre? Come on, 
Now, I was over there in, in Montana yesterday, and uh, they, were, they were pretty quick on, on the map, but I don't know, are you guys going to be as quick? 2,000. Okay. We had, we had two acres, but we got one right anyway. We put them on 10 acres. What's that going to be? 20,000. 20,000. Okay, quickly. This is the easy one. Anybody can get this. Even an NRCS guy, right? Okay. Um, I like to have a good time if you can't tell. Can, can those, if we put those, if we put those animals on those three different areas, you know, and the same amount of forage is out there, are they going to be able to stay on there the same length of time? No. Do, do you think they're going to have the same impact on those three areas if we left them on there the same length of time? Are they going to graze it as uniformly? Are they going to trample it as uniformly? There's going to be a whole different impact. It's going to be a whole different result depending on that stock density. Okay. So stock density is the most powerful tool um, we have to manage our grassland resources. It, it affects utilization, it reduces spot raising, it controls weed competition, it improves manure distribution, and it can produce seed to soil contact if that's what we're trying to do. I also believe it has the potential to improve and build more soil than we've ever thought possible before. Just to, just to give you an idea of what, of what we do in our operation and what these densities look like, okay? Now I know Gail had some pictures. Um, this, is, this is kind of an example of high density, but not real high density. You can see this is actually 200 pair uh, in June, and they're on, a, they're on a, a small area right there. The fence was here, poly wire, and then here, and here, and we're going, we're going away from the water. They do have access back to the water, but they basically live in the fresh area. Okay, I just want you to look at the spacing. This is about 80 or 90,000 pounds of stock density. Okay, just as a frame of reference is all we're looking at here. That's a close-up shot. Now, obviously that's some pretty big stuff, isn't it? Do you think they're going to eat all of that? No. In this case, we, we weren't really pushing them. These were cows that contract cows that we were trying to not not fatten but we didn't want to hurt them at all so they, they were they were had a pretty easy life um, they were trampling a little bit uh, they did, they came to us in pretty pretty poor shape so we were trying to be easy on them um, but just just kind of look at the spacing about 80,000 now this is a different set of contract cows there's 250 pair here and they're on about two and a half acres Okay, stock density up about 160, 170. Again, you know, a lot of times I have people say, well, you can't even put 250 cows on two acres. There's not enough room. Does it look like plenty of room, you guys? Okay. So just, just kind of looking at, the, looking at the spacing there. Now, here's one. These are not my pictures. These are from Kirk Gedzia out of, out of Texas, but they're really cool. Just shows a couple of things here. There's 500, there's 500 steers there. Can you see them? How about now? <laughs> now, here's the question for, for, for the guys here. Time lapse between the two pictures. A day? Hours. Hours? Any more? 15 minutes. Oh, now see, there we got somebody that knows the answer. About 15, 20 minutes, okay? Your, your clue is if you look at that Charlotte steer right there, he didn't, he didn't go very far, did he? Okay? Now, obviously, that's an annual, but, but that's what these guys are talking about, you know? And I, I'm sure some of, the, some of the folks here have done some of that as well. That was, by the way, that was, that was about 400,000 pounds of stock density, okay? So what's the big deal? You know, we've all had grazing systems before. We've rotated, and, and you know, I try to take care of my grass through the soil test. What's the big deal about this high-density thing, this mob grazing thing? And I, and I hate that term, really. I don't hate it, but it doesn't tell me anything, really. So soil health, water cycle, mineral cycle, and diversity. Those are the four things we're going to hit on real quick. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a picture from South Missouri, our friend Mark Bradley. Um, you got a little, you got an area of clover right here. 
grass all the way around him. What do you guys think? Now he did not, he didn't fertilize, he didn't broadcast any seed. What do you guys think created that little spot of clover right there? He fed a bale of hay. This guy's getting sharp now. So, so what did feeding that bale of hay do right there for that area? There was no clover seed in it, he swears. It was all grass hay. What did it do? This is a soil health conference, so you got to think on those lines, right? It increased the organic matter. Okay? Obviously the cows didn't eat it all. So what did that what did that layer of organic matter on the surface of the soil do? It kept it cooler. It fed the soil biology. Probably increased infiltration a little bit. It brought in some nutrients. There's no doubt. I'll give you that. Okay? But basically that that plant material, that dead plant material, created a perfect environment for the soil biology. It increased water infiltration. It created, it didn't change the it, it didn't change the pH all through the soil profile, but it did change the pH in a little narrow band that allowed the clover seed that was already there to germinate. So that, that led us to this question. Can we build soil fertility simply by adding plant material to the soil? No fertilizer, no annuals, nothing else. Can we do that? This is the place I took over in 07. Um, it had been continuously grazed for years when we, when we took it over in 07. We used some stock density on it in 07, and then we came back in 08, and we let it grow all year long. And this is some pretty high quality pasture, can't you tell? There, there might be a few grass plants down in there, but not much. It was pretty abused. A lot of annuals, queen ends, lace, a lot of different things. So we came in and, and trampled it um, for 12 hours, and then 10 days later, you're going to see this picture. Okay? You see all, the, all that green stuff? That's all clover. No clover was spread. No lime was put on it. And by the way, this, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ray. That's a ray for you. By the way. Ray, aren't you let it? By the way, no lime. The, the pH on this is probably 5. What did we do? We trampled down. In two years of trampling, we changed the pH right at the surface, not through the whole soil profile, but right at that surface. We, we made more, more fertility available. We enhanced the water infiltration. We created an environment that we could get a tremendous amount of clover. Now, that, that, that field turned from clover in a year, then the next year it was grass, and I need to take a picture of it now, but now it's a, it's a, it's a great stain of grass simply by the, using the tool of animal impact and, and high density to treat that field. That's a close-up. Any, any bare soil? No bare soil. Now, we still have some green leaves out here to, to carry on photosynthesis, but that is what we did. So, how do we build that soil? Well, first, we're, we're looking at a plant that is fully recovered. We want a plant that's as big as possible, okay? We want a plant that is, that is big and tall, that has as much above ground biomass as possible. So then we can have as big a root system as possible. This is from a study up in Canada in the 60s. Um, everybody's probably seen that, but it's just a great photo. Longer rest periods mean more, more roots, more plant material. How long is the rest period up here? I don't know and I'm not going to claim to. Okay. In our part of the world, to get a plant to this condition right here, depending on the year, depending on the moisture, you're probably looking at anywhere from 70 or 80 days to 120 days. If I'm going to err in, 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 in my frame right now, my, my mindset where we're trying to build soil, I want to make sure my plants are in this condition. There's times when we can graze them over in here. But if I'm going to make an error on the, the length of the grazing period right now, I want that length of the grazing period to be too long. I never want to cheat it too short. I want to make it too long. So if I have a plant that's a little too mature, that's fine. What does that do? It feeds the microorganisms. As I understand it, I'm not a, I'm not a microbiologist, but as I understand it, the number one food source 
for, a, for that soil biology, for the majority of it, is a living plant root. So which one's going to have a better food source? Now, I know, I know what you guys are thinking, right? That, that top number up there, it's not that non-alien or whatever that he said. But most of you are probably thinking that's like the federal deficit right now, right? <laughs> well, it's not. Believe it or not, it's bigger, OK? Um, the, the point is, it, it's not that you know, this is going to be the exact numbers and everything. This is just a shot from the soil food web. The, the point is not that this is what you want. The point is that we have livestock up here. As a livestock producer, I have cattle. Some of them have sheep. I have, I have livestock up here. But we also have livestock in the soil. And we need, to, we need to call them that. We need to treat them like livestock. Um, we need to feed them. Do you, do you, as a livestock producer, do you purposely feed your soil livestock with purpose and intent? Do you purposely feed your soil livestock? Withstands droughts better. I don't know about you guys, but it sounded like Gail had a little dry time. We went this year, we went from uh, the middle of July until the first of November, and we had five tenths of rain in August during that whole period of time. We got pretty dry. <clears throat> we had we had neighbors that were feeding hay in September and August. Um, we still had tall green grass because, and I don't have pictures of it, and I should, and I apologize. Um, my life is my life stays a little busy. If you couldn't if you couldn't tell, uh, he didn't mention the three kids either. So pulls minerals from deeper in the soil. Which plant's gonna pull minerals down there? This is some stuff I came across uh, a couple three years ago. I sat in an office when I'm there, which is not very often, with some soil scientists, um, and, and we were doing some digging, and I found this. This is for an Armstrong soil. It's a typical pet-on that they, that they use to designate uh, particular soils as, a, as, a, as an example of a particular soil. Armstrong is the third most common soil in the state of Missouri. What I want you to look at, you know, we've got depth over here to inches, um, and these are, just, these are just three or four, not anything in particular. Uh, potassium here. You see, and, and, and calcium is the same way. It's high at the surface. This has had some, some added fertility, um, commercial fertilizer. Then you see a, a zone right here that's a little bit lower, and then they start picking up. I think what's happened, at least in our part of the world, are, are shallow rooted cool season perennials that we have. You know, we're always taught, at least we used to be taught in our in our management intensive grazing systems, we want to keep that vegetation in that, in that perfect condition. We don't want to get too tall, but we don't want to get too short. Let's keep it in that per perfect condition. We're also taught that the roots are a reflection of the above ground biomass. So if we keep that grass in that perfect condition, we're going to have roots right there too. If you look at that, you know, if we keep our cool season grass eight or 10 inches, where do we see this deficiency right here? I think that's because if we keep those grasses in that, even if we don't keep them too short, if we keep them a little bit, those plants go down to that level and pull those minerals up, but anything that is below that is lost. If we don't have a plant, if we don't have plant diversity, if we don't allow the plants that we have there to get deep into this soil profile, we're giving up a wealth of fertility right there. Thousands of dollars of fertility is available to us if we have plants that have root systems that go down and get it. If we let the plants that we have get as big as they can, we can tap into that. So we talked about the roots. Now let's talk about the surface a little bit. Um, you can see this is just a picture where, where we trampled. Um, mulch down, there's still some green material, but we trampled it down. That taller canopy from that last picture allows us the opportunity to trample more material. The taller it is, the more material we have, excuse me, the more we can trample onto the surface of the soil. What does that, what does that do? You know, there's, you saw pictures from, from uh, soil temperature. This is just a couple I took. How far apart did I take these? Five feet. 
five feet apart, okay? Now, this was a hay field. It's still got some, it's still got some mulch and some cover on it. That's not even bare ground. This one right over here, okay? What's really, what's really neat is we and I don't have pictures. We've done a little bit of a little bit of monitoring of of the the air temperature above the surface of the soil in that taller canopy. Um, typically, our cool season grasses go into a slump in the middle of the summer because if they're short, they get hot and it, you know, the soil heats up. I think that they go into a slump primarily because of the soil temperature, but not and then also partially because of the air temperature. So if we've got a tall canopy. We're going to keep that air temperature cooler, even a foot above the surface of the soil. Improves water infiltration. You know, in our part of the world, we get 30 some inches, of 30, 30 to 35 inches, 36 inches of moisture. But you guys, your state, your state, or the, the, some of the corn yields that I've heard are very comparable to our state average. We get three times as much water. What's happening to it? It's all running off. In our pastures, we can improve that. You know, water holding capacity. Organic matter behaves like a sponge. Your soils are like ours. They've got a lot of clay in them. The, the advantage of that, of, of organic matter, is that it will ready, readily release the moisture back to a plant. Clays will hold it so tight the plant can't get it. Can we control runoff just with organic matter? I did a little work. We get, and I know you're probably not gonna like this, but a, a five and a half inch rain is a 10 year storm for us, okay? Theoretically, that happens every 10, every 10 years, but 2% organic matter will hold 21% of a five inch rain, 5%, 53, 8%, 85%. You know, the, this, this morning when Gail was talking, you know, he showed pictures of a flood, and then he showed, then he talked about a drought. A, a flood and a drought in the same area is a, is a is a classic example of a poor water cycle, of of ineffective water cycle, of, of lack of infiltration, and that is happening all over our country. You know, our our area is no different. You know, our average soil organic matters are two percent. When we should be eight or ten. If, if we could restore our soils, would we have flooding issues anymore? And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I know you guys are here for the right reasons, okay? Trampling speeds up that biogeochemical mineral cycle. Whenever we, you know, we were always taught to leave to leave some plants, you know, for 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 photosynthesis to gather sunlight, and that's and that has a valid point, but think about this, okay? If if I leave those if I leave those plants standing, and I rotate on to the next field, when I when I go through my whole system, whatever it is, however long it is, and I come back, that that plant material that I left standing. Not, not the regrowth, but the plant material that I left standing, is it going to be better quality or lower quality when I come back that next time? Lower, okay? It's going to be lower quality. So if it's going to be lower quality, you know, my cows aren't going to probably eat it, so why leave it there? Let's turn it into something that they will eat. Let's get that plant material on the surface of the soil where it can begin to break down. If I leave it standing up, it's going to weather, it's going to oxidize and go into the atmosphere, or it's going to take a long time to break down and fall over and cycle. I want it to be cycling and growing as fast as possible. I want my mineral cycle to be revved up and hyped up and, and cranking. Okay? That's an official NRCS term, too. Cranking. <laughs> Diversity. Four major plant types. You know, you guys have heard about that this morning. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Cool season grass, cool season broadleaf, warm season grass, warm season broadleaf. They had all of those. Right now, we're dealing primarily with cool season grasses. Cool season grass, cool season legume. We have to add some diversity. And I'll show an example of what that'll do. Why do we want diversity? All these different reasons. We can intercept sunlight in a different manner. Different plants have different leaf structure. Different plants have different roots. 
We want, we want a plant that will go down and, and grab a root here. We want a plant that's shallow and fibrous that will get all of the minerals in the shallow part of the soil. So we want a, a vast array of different types of plants. Not just different species, but different types. Here's an example. Good friend of mine over by Maryville in Missouri, Tim Kelly. This is his goal, profit and soil improvement. He has worked for, for several years to improve his soil, to improve his profit and productivity. You can see him standing in the field there. You can see the clover, the red clover, but you also see the blue stem. There's cool season grasses in it. There is, there is tree foil, red clover, white clover, less but these, the timothy, orchard grass, brome, bluegrass, fescue, blue stem, Indian grass. Okay, it's, it's a, and this is all established. This is not a prairie. Um, there's virtually no prairies left in, in, in our part of the world. So that's a close up. Now, obviously, he's strip grazing through here. There's a fence right on the other side of him. Um, there's a lot more cows than that, but. Uh, Obviously, they're not doing much with the blue stem. It's pretty mature at this time right now. Um, so, so they're trampling a lot of it down. Now, he's not making them eat everything, as you can see. That ensures a little bit of animal performance. If, if you make everything go to the ground, you know, do you know if they, if they went hungry or not? If there's a little bit left standing, that's kind of your clue that, well, there was a little something they could eat. Okay? So here's a close up. We got cool season grasses underneath. We got the warm season over top. So what has that mixture of diversity and high density done to his organic matter levels? Um, 10 years apart, we went from 3.9 to 6.9 on some fields, and this is not just one field, this is several fields. Same way here on all these. This one's a little shorter time frame. These soil tests, both years were taken by a professional agronomist, a hired consultant, not by the landowner. Okay, so they were not biased by the landowner. We can build soil a lot faster than we ever thought possible. Um, you know, NRCS has, in a lot of offices, um, we have a poster that, that says, you know, in the time it took to build an inch of topsoil, all these things happened, okay? And, it, and it's 400 and some years. I don't believe that anymore. Um, there's just too many examples, like Tim's, and, and many, many other people that are using this tool to, to just, to just in, increase and create a, a whole different level of, of soil production. So what has that done to forage production? Okay, The average for North Missouri, the average forage production for, for just medium productivity, medium soil, um, is about 8,000 pounds a year. 8,000 pounds is kind of the average. Now we're talking perennials, not annuals. You know, these guys, they're cheating with these, with these annuals over here. Okay. That's another discussion. Tim has produced a measured 18,000 pounds of forage per year. No, for, no added fertility for seven or eight years. Management and diversity. He didn't drag a drill across it. He didn't put any fertilizer on it. He grazed the cows on it. Okay? You think that would make a difference on your bottom line? A little bit? Animal performance. I, I, I'd be very remiss in, in not talking about performance. It's one, of the, it's one of the most important parts of this. Okay, If it's managed properly, it's really good. If you don't manage it properly, you can hurt performance on some cows. You know, I, I, did, I did a meeting like this up in Iowa a couple of years ago, sort of like this anyway, and and I said that, you know, I said that, that our first year or two, when we were really, when we were really getting aggressive with the density, you know, you can make those cows, when you hold them tight, you can make them, you can make them graze the, the thatch off the ground if you wanted them to. Um, they become very aggressive grazers. And, and you'll think, wow, they're doing, you know, they're eating along and they're, they're just eating everything. You have to watch performance. I was in a meeting in Iowa. And, and I said, you know, we heard, some, we heard performance on some cows. And there was a row of guys sitting over here, and, and they all started laughing except for one guy. And he kind of had his head down. And I said, I didn't think hurting performance on cows, you know, really hurting them was, was funny. And the guy lifted up, he said, he said it wasn't. He said, I killed some cows. 
Now, probably there was some underlying issues, some other health issues with those cows, but the point is, he was, he was so hard on them. He was making them eat parts of the plant that didn't meet their nutritional needs. You can't make them eat something that doesn't meet their nutritional needs. That's what goes on the ground. I can, I can make them eat every, every last plant if I want to because they become so aggressive. So if it's managed properly, performance can be really good. Energy protein ratio, they can balance it. You know, if you haven't ever heard Fred Provenza talk um, from Utah State, just, just they've done incredible work on, on livestock selectivity. And so while we want to use stock density as a tool, we don't want to remove completely livestock selectivity. We still have to let them choose and mix the parts of the plant that, make, that allow them to perform to our desired level. Um, the biggest mistake people make is what I said, scorched earth grazing, is eating everything down into the dirt. Okay? You, if, if, if that's a goal that you want to do, that's fine. But understand, you're not going to be able to use those cows in that manner for a long period of time. You know, cows are, cows are an awesome tool. We can, make them, we can make them work for a week or two, make them work really hard. And then we got to give them some time off if we did that. Now, if we don't make them work that hard, we don't have to give them that time off. But depending on what you're doing, that's, that's what you have to look at. You have to pay attention to animal performance. Um, most of the time, the goal should be 60% or less utilization by the livestock. Um, if, if we're grazing a really mature plant, you know, plant that's big and tall, we're probably only going to only have 20 or 30% of it that's going to meet the nutritional needs of that cow. So we're going to trample 60 or 70 or 80%. Okay? The, the, other, the other thing that I see is people say, well, I want to... I want to get to 100,000 stock density. That's just a really cool number, right? 100,000, six figures. The problem is to get to that with 1,250 pound cows eating 2.5% of their body weight, utilizing 60%, and only moving once a day, you got to have 4,000 pounds of forage. That's probably going to be doable on your, on your annuals, but I don't know about some of your rangeland. You'll have to do some math on that. How to make it work easily. You know, equipment, water systems, fence systems, um, livestock. The, all, all of those things are part of it. Those are, all, those are all the equipment. You know, when you go out to plant, when you go out to bale hay, you have to have the right equipment. And it's the same with, with grazing livestock in this manner. You've got to have the right equipment. You've got to have a, 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 some poly reels and some fence posts. You've got to have livestock that can tolerate you being that close to them. You've got to have livestock that are calm. You've got to have animals that do well on forage. You know, and that's a, that's a whole other talk. But that's the thing you've got to get out of the way. That's the biggest thing with all of this, with all this soil health stuff. You've got to get that butt out of the way. You know, but, but, I got to go bail hay. I don't have enough time. Is that a good line? Ah, I can do better. I don't have enough time. I'm gonna go bail hay. You know, hey, I don't think while we're talking about hay, we gotta talk about something else. I don't think we I don't think any of us realize how how damaging haying is to the soil in that area where we're even if we feed it back. Um I I just, you know, I don't think we, we understand how how damaged. We're removing nutrients, but we're also removing a food source for that soil biology. We're, we're taking that off. We're heating that soil up. We're killing soil biology when we, when we take that hay off of there because that ground gets hot fast, doesn't it? And they don't have time to move down through the soil profile. When we go through a drought, well, they can kind of move through the water and move down. But when we, when we take that hay off, you know, those guys don't have big long legs, do they? They can't go, whoop, he ate it off. We gotta make a run for it. They're, they're toast. You just, you just wiped them out. So I, I don't think we have, a, have an understanding of how damaging haying is. So our goal is we don't do any haying on our own land. You know, I can buy hay for less than the value of the N, P, and the K in a bale of hay. You know, now I know anybody in here that sells, this is the time where anybody in here that sells hay, close, close your ears, okay? It, 
Guys, you can buy hay from your neighbor. It's a free country. You can buy hay for less than the value of the, of the N, P, and K in it. Do it. Combine your own herds. How many of you have got more than one herd in the same place? You got a spring herd, a fall herd, yearlings, second calf heifers, first calf heifers, old cows, you know, stick them together. Now, when you do that, you have to understand you're going to have to manage them, manage them for the nutritional needs of the, of the animals that have the highest nutritional needs, okay? Um, combine different herds from different ranches. We did that. We had two places. Now we rotate through one. We walk them two and a half miles down the road, and we rotate through here. We doubled our stock density. We got rid of half of our work. This is the one I like. Combine herds with a, oh, combine herds with a neighbor. Tim Kelly did that, the guy that I showed up there. Tim had two places. He had a Bruce. Bruce, his neighbor, had a place. <clears throat> they combined their herds. They rotated them through Tim's. Tim took care of them. They went to Bruce's. Bruce took care of them. They doubled their stock density, got rid of half their work. They went on vacation a month and a half every every month and a half. Okay? We gotta think, we gotta think way different. You know, do it seasonally. You don't have to, you don't have to do it all year long. You don't have to do it all year long. Do, pick, pick a field and, and treat it, you know. I was over with, with Ann over in uh, Montana yesterday, and they had a field that they specifically treated that field with strip grazing in an effort to, to put material on the surface. You know, don't, you don't have to do it on the whole farm if you want to. Pick one field and say, I'm going to experiment, you know. I, I dare you, I dare you to pick one field and, and say, I'm going to, two weeks, okay, I'm going to, two weeks, I'm going to move cows every day. I'm going to move cows twice a day, morning and night. And, and, then, and then go back and come back and watch that field, you know. I don't think anybody's ever going to tell you to, to, to jump whole hog into something. You've got to understand how it is, what it works, okay? Just do it sometime. Um, keys. Have a plan, set some goals and targets. Keep records, monitor, and make adjustments. You know, what are your goals? Do you have specific goals? Do you have a goal for your farm? Do you have a resource goal? I want to build my organic matter to a certain level. Do you have financial goals? Do you have personal goals? What are those? Write them down. Monitoring. That's a fancy name for things you need to watch, things you need to pay attention to. Forage indicators, color, the density, the diversity, regrowth response. Those are all things you can look at. <coughs> livestock. What are the livestock indicators? Things that you need to pay attention to. Manure consistency, distribution, performance, health. Um, things you can, put a, you can put a number to, you can measure. Rest period, how long was that, was that before I came back? Um, how long was I into this particular field, okay? And then last, be, be observant. You know, here's a picture. I don't know if you can see that very good or not. That's a cucklebird, right? What's the end of it look like? It's chewed off, isn't it? This, this came from, from Mark Brownlee, a friend down in South Missouri, who's incredibly observant. He was, he was been trampling down a lot of material for the last two or three years and had, still was dealing with a pretty, a pretty worn out field that he was getting some annuals. But he's getting biological control from the rodents on his cucklebirds. How many of you would have seen that? Would have walked through your pasture slow enough, not zinged across it in your F-350 at 40 miles an hour? How many of you have walked through your pasture? How many of you have taken a chair out and rotated the cows into a into a field and took your lawn chair and sit there and watched them. Watch. I, I challenge you to do that too. Go sit there and watch them. Look at their selectivity. Look at look at what they eat, what they do. Okay. Be observant. This is a this is a, a very diverse field here. <clears throat> See the cobwebs? Okay. Spider webs, an indication of of soil health, right there. The soil is the basis of everything. I believe the soil is the most important thing we have to take care of. However, we do have to consider the whole when making those management decisions. Again, our resource, our financial goals, and our personal goals. It's not going <clears> to. <throat> it's not going to do us any good to build, you know, eight percent organic matter soil 
uh, for, our, for our resource goal if we are so hard on our cows that, that they all come up open and because we had all open cows we went broke and because we went broke we got divorced. You know, we, we have to integrate all of those things together, okay? That is what holistic management teaches, is to integrate everything. Everything has to be, has to be a part of everything else. The quality of our lives depends on the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. All of those things depend on the quality of the soil. Thank you.